You're listening to A New Beginning with Greg Laurie, a podcast supported by Harvest Partners. For more ways to deepen and challenge your spiritual walk, enroll in Pastor Greg's free online courses. Sign up at harvest.org. Peter said, I swear to God, I never knew Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter took a giant step backwards in his integrity and proclamation of the gospel. But Pastor Greg Laurie says God grants second chances. Believers can fall. Believers can stumble. But believers can get up again. For Peter, his setback was going to turn into a setup. His mess would be turned into a message. This is the day when the lost are found. This is the day for a new beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Again you hear all the angels are singing. This is the day, the day when life begins. Golfers know the meaning of the word mulligan. Bad golfers know it very well. A mulligan is a do-over. Take that swing over again. You're good. Well, thankfully, the Lord allows mulligans in the spiritual life. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie helps us follow the biblical account of a certain spiritual failure. We'll see what it was that led to the sin and how that sin was forgiven and fellowship restored. We have a story before us now in the Bible of a man who was overtaken by sin. A man who probably never realized that one thing would lead to another and through five steps he fell away from the Lord. And this man was a full-fledged apostle of Jesus Christ and his name is known to all of us. I want to tell the story of Simon Peter and his fall and his restoration. Hence the title, A Second Chance in Life. Look with me, if you will, at Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 27. And by the way, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. On the way, Jesus told them, All of you will desert me, for the Scriptures say God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised from the dead, I'll go ahead before you into Galilee and I'll meet you there. Peter said, Even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, well, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others bowed the same. Now there are five steps that led Peter down to his denial of Christ. Here's step number one if you're taking notes. His first step down was self-confidence. Self-confidence. Go back to Mark 14, verse 29. Peter said to Jesus, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. And this is after the Lord revealed that Judas would betray him. So Peter's effectively saying, hey, even if Judas betrays you, I'll, I'll never let you down. And he's almost boasting at the expense of others, even if these others fall short. I, remember you gave me that new name, Rock? I, Rocky, will never let you down. The Bible says pride goes before a fall. Peter's second step down was prayerlessness. I'm not even sure if that's a word, but it's a real thing, prayerlessness. How many of us would be honest to admit that we need to pray more? I know that I do. And uh, Peter was sleeping when he should have been praying. Going back to Mark 14, verse 37. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane now. Jesus says to the disciples, Peter, James, and John, watch with me. Watch and pray. And we read these words. And this is from the New King James Version. He came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, why are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. Here's Jesus contemplating the horrors of the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
And according to Dr. Luke, he's sweating, as it were, great drops of blood, literally sweating blood, as he thinks about what is ahead. All he asked for was a little companionship from Peter, James, and John, and they fell asleep. You know, it's interesting, and the Bible sleep is spoken of as sort of a negative thing. It says to Christians, now is the time to wake up for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And we all know what it's like to fall asleep at an inappropriate time. Uh, maybe you've fallen asleep in church. By the way, pastors know when you fall asleep. I, I think it comes as a revelation to people to know that not only can you see me when I'm speaking, but I can see you. And when someone nods out and they make like put their hands up to their face like they're praying. I know you're sleeping, okay? Especially when you start snoring. But uh, we always deny it when we're sleeping for some reason. Some will say, did you fall asleep? No, no, it, you did. And these guys fell asleep. But you see, Jesus was getting them ready. He's saying, boys, you need to pray. Because he knew a storm was brewing. He knew that hard times were ahead and they needed to be praying. Literally, the devil's son is on his way with some armed guards to arrest Jesus. And it's a reminder to us that prayerlessness can be as much of a sin as breaking a commandment. See, there's not just sins of commission. That's when you do what you should not do. But there are sins of omission when you don't do what you should do. The Bible says to him that knows to do good and does not do it to him it is sin. So if the Lord impresses upon your heart the need to pray and you don't pray, that could be a sin. Jesus is saying to Peter, James and John, guys, you need to pray. Yeah, whatever, we're gonna catch some Z's right now. That was a mistake. His third step down was Peter trusted human efforts instead of God's power. He trusted human efforts instead of God's power. Verse 46 of Mark 14. They laid their hands on him and took them. And one of them who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now Luke fills in some details here. And we find out who one of them was. It was Peter. And he's soundly rebuked by Jesus after he does this. And Christ says to Peter, Put your sword in its place, for those that live by the sword will perish by the sword. Don't you realize I could pray to my Father and He would provide me with 12 legions of angels? Now, in fairness, we can understand Peter's outrage. Judas Iscariot, he's hung out with this guy for three years plus, thought of him as a friend. And yet here is Judas who's betrayed Jesus. And how did Judas betray Jesus? The Bible says with a kiss. I mean, couldn't Judas just say, look, it's the guy I'm pointing to. That's Jesus. Arrest him. Or the guy I'm shaking his hand. There he is. He betrays him with a kiss. And in the original language, it wasn't just a peck on the cheek. It was repeated kisses. And, and he's appearing to be someone who loves Jesus when he's betraying him. And Jesus says to Judas as he approaches, friend, why have you come? Friend? He should have said, fiend, why have you come? Jesus knew why he came. But I think Judas missed it. But Christ was giving to Judas one last opportunity to repent of his sin. And Judas did not take it. Remember, Satan filled Judas's heart. So Peter's just ticked off. He's angry. He's a fisherman, not a swordsman. He pulls off the sword. Whoom! He takes a swing. Off comes the ear of a guy named Malchus, another gospel tells us, who probably was leading the charge. And Jesus reaches down, picks this man's ear up, and reattaches it. So the last miracle of Jesus before he died on the cross was the healing of a man who was coming to arrest him. And it was also a miracle that was done to cover the blunder of a disciple. What an amazing story that is. Pastor Greg Laurie will have the second half of his message in just a moment. We really enjoy when Harvest Ministries and Pastor Greg's teachings are impacting lives. Pastor Greg, you are my favorite pastor. You preach from the heart and I learn so much from you. God bless you and your family. I told my daughter and her family about you. They live right by your church and have started attending. Praise the Lord. 
Hi, Pastor Greg. Your book, Fame, along with the Jesus Revolution film, has led me back to Jesus. They've also shown God's love for a sinner like me. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be able to provide so many resources through Harvest Ministries. Check them out for yourself at harvest.org. And would you consider becoming a Harvest Partner? If so, you can make a donation at harvest.org. That's harvest.org. Well, we're studying Peter's failure in Mark chapter 14 today. Pastor Greg is helping us focus on why it happened. Let's continue. Two more steps that led to Peter's fall. Step number four. He was warming himself at the enemy's fire. He was warming himself at the enemy's fire. Go back to Mark 14, verse 66. We read, As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and she saw Peter warming himself. She looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. Remember what Jesus said? You will deny me three times before the rooster crowed has crowed twice. So so he's warming himself by the fire. Have you ever tried to go undercover as a Christian? Sort of hide your faith? Go unnoticed in the larger crowd? Following at a distance, Peter became cold and was attracted to the warmth of the fire. He didn't think that anyone would recognize him there. Now he is following Jesus still, so we have to give him some credit. He hasn't run away, but he's not doing anything either. In fact, we're given a detail here in Matthew 26, verse 58. We read that Peter went and sat with the servants to see the end. See, that's what he thought it was, the end. There's no more hope. Everything's gone off the tracks. Jesus, in Peter's estimation, was supposed to establish his kingdom and drive out the Romans, and now he's been betrayed by one of us. And now he's going to die on a cross but I guess I'll just stay here and see the end. But it was not gonna be the end. It was gonna be a beginning, a new beginning. It's not a bad thing that he was warming himself by a fire, but he's with these people around the fire. The Bible says in Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. See, that's what was happening. He was mixing in with this crowd and he's called out. Right there he should have said, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. But he denies it. Denial number one. Now his fifth step down, another denial. Luke's gospel tells us some time elapsed before the first and second denial. So Peter could have left that place, but he stayed inexplicably. He had plenty of time to think about it. And we might criticize him for it, but wait a second. The last time you were tempted, did you flee? Did did you remove yourself from that place where you were being pulled down? When that scene in the movie uh, came on the screen, did you walk out of the theater or did you turn the TV off? When your buddy mocked or cursed God, did you speak up for your faith? That temptation from that girl that came your way, did you flee like Joseph did? See, it's very easy for us to critique, but we do the same. And we get compromised. And that's what Peter was doing right now. He was trapped in a miserable web of compromise. Suddenly someone recognizes Peter. Mark 14 verse 69. A servant girl saw him again. And began to say to those who stood by. This is one of them. But he denied it again. A little later those who stood by Peter. Said to him again. You're one of them. For you're a Galilean. And your speech shows it. And he began to curse and swear saying, I do not know the man of whom you speak. A second time, the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. You're a Galilean, they said. Now we don't understand what that means necessarily. But it was sort of an insult. Because uh, those that lived in Jerusalem, a sophisticated city at the time, thought of the people that lived in the region of Galilee as at, at being at a lower level. 
It would be sort of like saying, you're a country bumpkin, or you're unsophisticated, or you don't know what you're talking about. You're not educated like we are in Jerusalem. And, uh, and then Peter denies again, and the rooster crows. The interesting thing is that it says he took an oath. Peter should have just come clean and admitted he was a follower of Jesus Christ. But verse 71 says he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know this man of whom you speak, and then the rooster crows. Now when the Bible says he cursed and swore, it doesn't mean that Peter swore like a sailor, though he was a sailor. <laughs> but it's a different term. It means to take an oath and to swear to God. So and what could best be described as the worst illustration of taking the Lord's name in vain, Peter effectively said, I swear to God, and I take an oath right now, I never knew Jesus Christ. Now Luke fills in an important detail. Luke 22, verse 59. While he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, listen to this, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, what he had said to him, and he went out and wept bitterly. The Lord looked at Peter. So at the very moment of his third denial, and the rooster crows, who appears on the scene, Jesus, they're leading him from one place to another, and he makes eye contact with Peter. Imagine that if you can. What kind of expression was on the Lord's face? Do you think he rolled his eyes like, what a loser? Do you think he looked at Peter with scorn and anger? No, actually, I think he looked at Peter with deep love. Did this all come as a surprise to Jesus? No. He knew Peter would do this. He told Peter he would do this. Did Jesus know Peter would fail? Absolutely. Was Peter still a believer at this moment? Yes, he was. Believers can fall. Believers can stumble. But believers can get up again. Peter needed to remember that Jesus said, when you have returned you will strengthen your brothers. In other words, this setback is temporary. See, for Peter, his setback was going to turn into a set up. And God was going to use this failure as a way for Peter to encourage other people. Yes, his mess would be turned into a message. This is a great example to us that anybody can fall into sin. But Peter was really repentant. The Bible says he wept bitterly. The Bible says godly sorrow produces repentance. See, everyone's gonna sin. And when you sin and feel bad about that, that's a good thing because that means your conscience is working. But if you can sin and sin again and even sin some more, even doing the, committing the same sin repeatedly and feel no remorse, no guilt, something isn't working right in your heart and in your soul. The conviction of the Spirit that will produce guilt is a reminder that you need to get right with God. Peter wept bitterly. Are you sorry for your sin? Now let me ask a follow-up question. Are you sorry enough to stop? This is a hopeful story. Because Peter went out and wept bitterly, but three days later Jesus rose again from the dead. And what was the message? It was go tell the disciples, and Peter, he's risen. Why wasn't it go tell the disciples and John? Or go tell the disciples and Andrew or Matthew. <laughs> it's go tell the disciples and Peter. Why was Peter singled out? Because he needed a special word from the Lord. Am I talking to someone right now that needs a special reminder from God that you are loved by him? Well, let me say that to you. God loves you. God longs for a relationship with you. And when you run from him or fall spiritually. He longs for you to return to him again. God says in Jeremiah three twenty two, return you faithless people and I will cure you of backsliding. How is this all possible? Through the death of Jesus. Where was Jesus headed? He was headed to the cross to die for the sins of Simon Peter, to die for the sins of the apostles, to die for the sins of all the people of that day, to die for the sins of people of every generation. He was going to the cross to die for your sins and mine. I love the way that the apostle Paul personalized it when he said of Christ, he loved me and gave himself for me. It's personal. 
Jesus died on that cross for you. Why? Because he knew there was no other way for you to be made right with God. Do you think good works will get you to heaven? Do you think uh, living a better life is going to get you closer to God? It won't. No, you see, every one of us falls short of God's glory. Every one of us breaks His commandments. And that separates us from Him. But Christ died for our sin and paid for our sin. So what you need to do to come into this relationship with God, what you need to do to be forgiven of your sin, what you need to do to know that you go to heaven when you die, or what you need to do to come back to the Lord is admit you're a sinner, turn from that sin, and put your faith in Jesus. Would you do that right now? Yes, there can be a second chance in life for you. Jesus Christ, who died on that cross and rose from the dead three days later, is alive and here. And he's knocking at the door of your life and he's saying, if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. So why don't you open that door, so to speak? Why don't you invite Jesus into your life? Listen, if you would like your sin forgiven, if you would like to know that you'll go to heaven when you die, if you would like that second chance in life I've been talking about, you can pray a prayer with me right now. I'll pray a simple prayer. And I'll ask you to just stop what you're doing wherever you are. You could bow your head, close your eyes if you like. You can pray with your eyes open if you want. But I would ask you to pray this out loud. And this is a prayer where you are asking God to forgive you of your sin. A prayer where you're asking Jesus Christ to come into your life. Or a prayer where you're recommitting your life to the Lord. If you need to do this, do it right now with me. Let's pray. Pray these words. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. But I know that you are the Savior who died on the cross for my sin. I turn from my sin now. And I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Thank you for hearing this prayer and thank you for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, hopefully you prayed along with Pastor Greg Laurie just now and entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you did, we'd like to first of all say congratulations. You've just made the best decision of your life. But we'd also like to make available Pastor Greg's New Believer's Bible. It'll help you get well grounded in God's Word and build a solid foundation for your relationship with the Lord. You can request it free of any charge when you call us at 1-800-821-3300. That's a 24-7 phone number, 1-800-821-3300 or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514, or go online to harvest.org and click Know God. Pastor Greg? Well, I'm here with my friend Levi Lusco today. Of course, Levi is the pastor of Fresh Life Church, and he's also a prolific author. And he's written a brand new book, which is a devotional for kids called Marvel at the Moon. I know Levi very well. I've actually known him since he's been a little kid. Now he's a young man. And I know that he loves his wife, and I know that he loves his family. And he also loves good coffee. <laughs> but now, a new discovery for me, I didn't know the extent of it, but Levi really loves outer space. Because in this new book that he's written for children, Marvel at the Moon, he really engages kids on this Topic. So, Levi, I know that you preach from your pulpit every week at Fresh Life Church, and of course, you write many books, but this one is for the kids. Tell me, how is this different to write for kids than for an adult? Well, you know, being being a, a grown up child myself, a big kid like like you, Greg, <laughs> uh, I, I don't feel like it took too much work. Um, I, I'm very easily amused, I'm, and I'm I, I just am a little a little boy in a 41 year old's body. I think sometimes, especially when I get around astronauts and NASA, um, I got to send my book about the moon to the space station. My friend, mm. who's an astronaut, flew it with him on a mission, and it got to spend six months orbiting the planet on the International Space Station. And I'm just like, when I got wow. to go watch him take off at the launch, you know, these, these things are incredible. The Saturn V rocket that took the Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and, and, and Charlie Duke to space, 
it it took off 13 tons faster than a bullet leaving a gun. Wow. I mean, it's unbelievable. Six mm. miles a second, this thing travels. Uh, the most powerful rocket ever launched by man is the Saturn V rocket. It's uh, the the size of a, a 36-story building, and it takes off that quickly. It's unbelievable. And you can't watch that and feel like you're a big deal. You're like, oh, my gosh, this, I'm so small. This is so massive. You feel it in your chest. Uh, but but trying to capture that feeling and that emotion is what I want people to feel reading this book. I want people reading t- to their kids at bedtime or at breakfast or putting the audio book on in the car on the way to school or something just to have that feeling of, wow, excitement, you know, your pulse racing. And that's how we should feel about God, because if, with apologies to the Saturn V rocket, it God makes it look like a bottle rocket because he's so power <laughs> powerful. You know, he spoke stars into existence and he he rides on the wind like it's his chariot. And in his temple, everybody mm-hmm. says glory. So the way I felt at that rocket launch is the way we should all feel having our quiet time or worshiping him. We should come kneel before the Lord our God, for he is our maker. Thanks, Levi. So that's great insight from Pastor Levi Lusco, talking about his new book, Marvel at the Moon, 90 Devotions for Kids, based on outer space. I think your kids are going to really like this. And that's why we're offering it to you for your gift of any size to our ministry. And when you send that gift in, and I ask you to be generous, we use that to continue this ministry. You know, we want to reach people of all ages. And all the time, I get letters from not only older folks who listen, but they tell me the little ones listen as well. And so this is a devotion that is going to be great for the kids. Marvel at the Moon by Levi Lusco. Dave, tell them how they can order a copy. Yeah, just give us a call and mention that title, Marvel at the Moon. We're eager to send a copy your way to thank you for your partnership. We're completely listener-supported, so your investment makes a big difference. Just call us at 1-800-821-3300. We can take your call anytime, again at 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or go online to harvest.org. Hey, everybody. I want to encourage you to check out the new Harvest Plus app. It's on Roku, Apple TV, and Google Play, among others. And you can stream incredible content on all major platforms for free. You're going to find live events, our evangelistic films like A Rush of Hope. Johnny Cash, The Redemption of an American Icon. Steve McQueen, The Salvation of an American Icon. And our newest film, Fame. Plus, our TV programs, our podcast, Harvest at Home, and a lot more. Stream it all on any device for free using the new Harvest Plus app. Well, next time, Pastor Greg takes a revealing look at the significance of the Lord's death at Calvary. It's a look at what Jesus' sacrifice means to believers today. Join us here on A New Beginning with pastor and Bible teacher, Greg Laurie. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to A New Beginning. This is a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners. So for more content that can help you know God and equip you to make Him known to others or to learn more about how you can become a Harvest Partner, just go to harvest.org.